I have. All right, so I think we all probably remember how phase diagram, the general shape of phase diagrams. One of the parts that I always forget that I have to work my way through every single time I follow the is which side is pressure and which side is temperature. Um, you can either have that memorized or if you kind of just remember that up over here is our supercritical fluid, liquid's going to go in the middle, right? That means down here has got to be gas. So does that make this pressure or temperature? That is, generally speaking, that's the logic that I go through every time I do one of these diagrams. I've been doing this for, for almost 20 years now, and I still have to think through that logic every time um, with some of these steps. So we know it's going to have a triple point, right? We know that there's going to be something to look over here. It's got a critical point. There's our triple point. We have a critical temperature and critical pressure. We also have a normal melting point and boiling point. And we have the triple point um, temperature and pressure as well. And so if this is 188 Kelvin and 174 Tor, How do we figure out what the slope of that liquid solid interface is going to look like? It's going to have a positive slope or a negative slope? And how can we tell? So, normal boiling point, or sorry, we want the normal melting point of 191 Kelvin, right? This is the 188 Kelvin. What's the normal, the normal melting point is going to be at what pressure? 760. So this isn't to scale, but that's enough for us to say, okay, well, 760 is here. And 
the melting point is at 191, right? So again, not to scale, but there's our, our melting point right there. So because the normal melting point is to the right of our triple point, we know it's got to have a positive slope. It's going to be going up into the right. So what does that tell us about its density? Solid versus liquid. And why do you say that? When uh, you heat it up, it gets spread apart. As a positive slope. Because it has a positive slope? Yeah, because it has a positive slope. <laughs> Yeah. Well, so generally speaking, you're right. When you heat things up, they spread out. Most things are more dense as, as a solid than they are as liquid. Water is an exception, though, so exceptions exist. So the, the slope here tells us, though, if we're sitting in here as a liquid and we increase the pressure, we're, we're pushing down on it, right? We're forcing those things to become, those atoms become closer together when we increase the pressure, right? And what happens when we increase the pressure? It goes from being a liquid to a solid. <clears throat> so that tells us right there that it's more dense as a solid than a liquid. If it was, if we're talking about about water, water's phase diagram has a negative slope. So for water, when you start as a solid, you start as a solid and you increase the pressure, you go from solid to a liquid. So the slope is what tells us whether it's more dense as a solid or a liquid. You guys talk about ice skating with this with these phase diagrams that get brought up at all of the application. Um, when you're ice skating, you're actually not skating on ice. You're actually gliding on a really thin layer of liquid water. Yeah, that's why you need ice skates. You can't ice skate without skates, right? Because you got to take your body weight and turn it into extra pressure on the ice that causes the ice to go from solid to a liquid when you put that extra pressure on it. So you're actually gliding on liquid water that then refreezes when the skate leaves it. It turns. When you remove the pressure, it goes back that way. And it allows it to expand out a little bit more back into being a solid. Um, I really like phase diagrams just for because they help understand a lot of weird phenomena that happens when it comes to phase changes. Um, and there's some good, there's some good research projects in there too. It's, and it's just a good review of phase change because phase change is also an equilibrium process, right? We think of, you guys talk about chemical versus physical changes back in something we don't really spend much time on because it's really kind of semantics. Any change can be written as a chemical change. Um, and, and it has its own delta, delta G and delta H associated with it, right? So water as a liquid turning to water as a gas or water as a solid. That's usually what would be considered a physical change, but we can write it as a chemical change and we can find equilibrium constants and things like that for this process. Um, I to bring up phase changes, even though that's kind of its own chapter a few chapters ago, right? All right. What does the 760 come from? Because it says the normal boiling point. Normal means STP, not STP, but at standard pressure. So 760 torr, it's one atmosphere of pressure. Okay. So that's our, anytime you see normal, that's going to mean at atmosphere, at standard atmosphere of pressure. All right. So the first time you see this, you may not have thought to go through that whole process, but that's why we're in class two to learn how to think about these things, right? Does the logic that I use to draw that phase diagram and pick whether that slope was positive or negative, does that all make sense? If you know that a phase diagram has to have a triple point, has to have a boiling point, has to have a melting point, has to have a critical point, that's usually enough for you to get the general shape of it and to learn some really 
valuable things about that, that system. How about colligative properties? Who remembers colligative properties? Freezing point depression, boiling point elevation, all that good stuff. Um, you did, uh, did you use molality as your concentration unit? Fun fact about molality is literally the only place in chemistry that that concentration unit is ever used is teaching gen chem students about colligative properties. <laughs> it, like, you can do it. I read an interesting report on this. They did a, a, liter a meta analysis of all the chemistry literature in, that's been published since 1950. And the word molality only shows up in gen chem textbooks and in papers written by people that are teaching gen chem classes about teaching gen chem. <laughs> it doesn't get used anywhere else. So I really don't like that unit, but for whatever reason, it does make the equation nice and simple, and we still have to use, deal with the fact that those KF values and KB values show up with these molality units in there. Um, it turns out that the equation looks a lot more complicated if you do it with mole fraction. You can do some algebra substitution. You can turn the delta T, delta TB equals, was it I, molality, K B like that's it, right? Um, you can actually do some substitutions and turn molality into mole fraction, but you wind up with a much more complicated equation to do that. Mole fraction is more universal one. Um, concentration unit, but for whatever reason, whoever first wrote a gen chem textbook decided molality. That was that's a good idea. We're gonna use that. Um, and it's just stuck with ever since. Right. Um, oh, this is actually, so this is one, a word problem where we could work backward from vapor pressure to get to molality, right? So you actually have to do a couple of different polygative property problems here. I'm gonna skip this one for now. We might come back to it if we have time later. Um, does anybody remember the equation for vapor pressure? Basically, your vapor pressure of any compound is just going to be the mole fraction of that compound times its standard vapor pressure. So we can work backwards from that, we can get mole fraction of ethanol. And then from mole fraction of ethanol, we can work out what molality is, and then we can plug it in here. Just a little bit of algebra in remembering some of the, how some of these equations work. All right, here is a more relevant one to what we've been talking about. If we start by making a buffer by dissolving 15.5 grams of sodium hydrogen carbonate in water, and then we add some sodium hydroxide to it, this is a common way of making a buffer. You're not, you don't start by mixing together hydrogen carbonate and carbonate, you just put all of it as hydrogen carbonate, and then you just add some hydroxide to turn some of the hydrogen carbonate to carbonate. What's the pH going to be of this system? How do we figure out the pH of a buffer? pH equals. Negative log is pH, right? But there's that other equation too that was pKa. Oh, close. You're headed the right way. Plus the log of the ratio. The log of the ratio of the deprotonated form over the protonated form. So if we know what this ratio is and we know what Ka is, we can get pH here, right? So how do we figure out? One, let's let's tackle the, the um the KA issue first. That's probably a quicker question. Worth thinking about. 
We have Ka value, two different Ka values for carbonic acid. Which Ka value are we going to use? Oh, one at a time. One at, it does, it happens one at a time, right? But we're starting with, so let's, what is the process? Carbonic acid reacts to make hydrogen carbonate, which then reacts to make carbonate. What about the sodium? Does that not matter? Or? It's, a, it's a spectator ion. It's not going to affect pH at all, right? So Ka1 is for this process, right? For the first proton being pulled off of carbonic acid. Ka2 for the second reaction. Which one of those is actually the equilibrium process that's going to be happening here? Why? We're starting in the middle, and then what are we doing? Making our way out. Right, but which direction? Right. Mm -hmm. And how do we know that? Because that's our final We're point. adding a bit of base. We're adding, We're adding a base. We're adding hydroxide. So if we started from hydrogen carbonate, we added HCl, we'd be adding extra H pluses. So we'd be, we'd be dealing with this equilibrium. We're starting in the middle and adding a base, so we're pulling the protons off of the hydrogen carbonate. So we're dealing with this equilibrium. So that tells us there's the Ka value we're going to use. In our two A minus and HA, this is going to be HA, this is A minus. So then we just need to know our molar ratio of these two. How many moles do we have of each of them? And that's enough to figure out pH, right? Of course, we should probably actually go through the process and get an answer here, since I'm very good at hand waving away. And you guys know how to do the rest of that calculation, right? We should probably actually do some of them, make sure that you remember how to do this. So I'm going to clear. Uh, we'll just go to we'll just white out the screen real quick. That's not going to work, I take it back, because we're going to need these numbers, aren't we? We'll just do that. So we've got HCO3. We can write the for the sake of, of uh, having a balanced reaction. We can write the sodium in there, even though it's not going to really be matter, right? What are we going to make? What's our product going to be from this reaction? Na2CO3. Na2CO3 and H2O. H2O. You got Na2, right? Yes, thank you. <laughs> and really, I wrote an equilibrium arrow here, but we're dealing with a strong base. So, really, we're going to treat this more or less like it's just going to be stoichiometry. When we have a weak base reacting with water, we're going to write it as an equilibrium process. But when we have a strong base, we're going to assume this reaction is going to happen to completion with its sig figs. So to get our ratio of, remember, we're trying to get to A minus over HA. We just need to know how many moles of hydrogen carbonate we start with and how many moles of hydroxide we're adding because that's gonna give us this number, right? So long as we have this number and our excess reagent over here, that gives us our ratio. So 15.50 grams of uh, sodium hydrogen carbonate. Has anybody done that, turned that into moles yet? Yeah, it's uh, 0 0.18, or, I think so. Perfect. That sounds good. So just take 15.5 grams, divide by the molecular weight, right? And 
every close is it what 60? 84. 84. Zero, zero, Right, so that's going to give us our 0.185 moles. Looking at sig figs, we probably want one more sig fig on here, right? 0.185. What? <laughs> well, well, I, give me one more digit, I need. 184. How many moles of hydroxide are we adding? That one I can do in my head. One, two, five. Oh, one, two, five. Three sig figs. Is everybody fairly comfortable with going from molarities and volumes to moles using that 0 0.50 moles per liter? If not, we'll get more practice with that coming up. So how do we figure out how many, what is our ratio? Remember, this is where we're trying to go, right? How do we know what that ratio is going to be? Ice table. Ice table. Bingo. These are our initial amounts. If we're doing stoichiometry, no. An ice table is really just a tool for the sake of keeping track of a bunch of different linear combinations, right? Linear equations that all have the same change value or a related change value. So as long as you're consistent, you can do them in moles or in molarity. If we're going to do them in molarity, we would have to do the molarity of the combined equation, the combined reaction, the 1.25 liters and the, the 250 mils. But all we're really doing is keeping track of the change, right? The moles are changing and the molarities are changing. As long as we're consistent, we can just use do the ice table with moles as well. Where you have to be careful is you can't plug it into an equilibrium expression as moles um, because you, you run into unit problems with that. So that's why for equilibrium ice tables, you want it to always be in molarity. For stoichiometry problems, we don't care as long as we're consistent. What's our change going to be here? <laughs> Yeah, just make everything minus x, right? Or, or plus x. I don't know what x is. Plug it. Well, we so if it was the equilibrium problem, we plug it into Ka expression, right? And solve for x. If it's a stoichiometry problem. This is one of the reasons why I introduce ice tables in, in Chem 101 when you start dealing with stoichiometry, because it really is just stoichiometry. If this is not equilibrium, we're assuming this goes to completion. Oh, zero. We know that one of these numbers has to be zero, right? At the end, we're using up all of one of our reactants. In other words, whatever our limiting reactant is, is going to have a final concentration of zero, or final moles of zero. Which that right there, this column right here now, is enough to figure out what x is, right? What's x? Zero. That'd be 0.125 moles. That 0.125 moles of, of sodium hydroxide, we're using all of the hydroxide up because we have less of it. So we have no moles left. 
that tells us what X is. So coming back over here, we're trying to get to do this ratio so we can plug it into the Henderson Hasselbalch equation, right? A minus is our carbonate. I just erased it, but what was our final constant or our final number of moles of carbonate? 0.125, right? We took all of these and turned them into carbonate. And to be consistent, yes, we should probably keep things in concentrations now that we we're doing the math here. Um, if you look at the units, it's going to be moles per liter over moles per liter here, which means we're going to be dividing by the same volume on top and bottom. So really, the mole ratio is the same as the molarity ratio. But for the sake of being consistent with our equation, putting the molarity. So we'll get 0 0.125 moles over what's our final volume? 1.50 liters. What's our final concentration of HA? This minus 0.125, right? Because it's one to one ratio, we can do that. We don't need to show the stoichiometry step. Oh, divided by the same volume. I always thought that my teachers had really bad in writing until I realized how hard it is to write facing backwards with your hand backwards while trying to stay out of the way of the board. Uh, um, the 1.50 liters, where is that from? I'm sorry. No, no problem. Oh, you're adding that. Okay. We added 1.25 okay. liters originally, and then we added 0.25 liters to it. So to get a final answer here, final pH is going to be negative log of Ka2 plus log of 0.125 moles ah, Really doesn't like when I write close to the buttons. And that's going to be over the 1.5, uh, but I don't have a calculator up here. What do we get? Let's, I guess, let's go ahead and do that. Be consistent. What's 0.125 over 1.50? Oh, I should be able to do that. 0.83. 0.83. Five six. Yeah. And if I had room, I'd write one more sig fig, but let's just ignore that for now. And then what do we get here? They're going to get 0 0.06 ish, something really close to 0 0.06. 0 0.059. 0 0.059. Molarity is 0 0.0396. Okay. Oh. 0.396? Yeah. Would you only keep two sig figs though since the subtraction? After the subtraction, we're only going to wind up with two sig figs. Yeah. And really, it gets a little bit dicey anyway because we didn't learn sig fig rules for logs, right? Turns out logs have their own sig fig rules as exponent, just like 
multiplication and division are different than addition and subtraction. Exponents have their own sig fig rules too. We're not going to get into learning those rules. So we'll just in general say pH, we're always going to report it to the hundredths place and just not worry about learning new sig fig rules for exponents. If you're interested in sig figs and uncertainty, I can go through the process. Talk to me at break. I'm not going to subject the whole class to that. <laughs> so in other words, it doesn't matter that much what we plug in for here but when it comes to the sig figs. What do we get for a final answer? 11.00. Go to the hundredths place. 10.65. I guess I lied. I will subject everybody to this, but just really quickly, you're not going to be graded on. You keep when you take the log of something, you keep the same number of decimal places as you had sig figs. So technically, this is two sig figs because when you take the log of something, the 0. 0.65 are the actual sig figs because the 10 is really just measuring what digit you went to, right? That's basically the same as the power in a scientific notation number, right? And so it's the decimals after the decimal point that are actually the sig figs in a number where you've taken the log of something. So this is, we kept two sig figs by doing this because we had two sig figs right there. But all you really need to know as far as this class is for pH, always go to the hundredths place. I'm curious, would the KA2 would then have like 11 sig figs? No, so that's why. So this is two sig figs because if you remember going back to counting sig figs, those are sig figs. The eleven is not. When you take the log of it, you're going to get eleven point something, right? Sig figs. So the eleven don't it doesn't count as sig figs. Just when you take the log of it. Yeah, but it's that many decimal places. You would keep two decimal places. When you take the log of it for this class, right? But like if we were doing it, so you would still only keep two because this is these two sig figs counts. When you take the log of it, you go to the hundredths place. <laughs> if we had 4.72 and we took the negative log of it, then we could go to the thousandths place. But anyway, ask me that at break so we're, we're we can move on um, for everybody else to see. Good question, though. All right. That was a little convoluted for something I can, I can ask a really, seems like a pretty straightforward question, right? One sentence question with some numbers in it and some KA values. And that was still kind of a convoluted problem to have to work through, right? It's why nobody gets 100% on chemistry tests um, because there's just so many places to mess up. So I get that. Have you had Zane? <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what happens, but I've never given a chemistry test that was where it would somebody turned in a perfect test. There's always a sig fig error someplace. Or him. I've had some that went over 100%, but that's be because there was bonus points in it. And it was like a 99 plus two. So let's see what happens. I'm excited for that. <laughs> All right. Let's talk a little bit about different types of equilibrium. So we've done, been doing Ka, Kb, talking about acids and bases. Um, when we start looking at dissolving ionic compounds in water, turns out that's an equilibrium process too, because there's a point where it no longer continues to happen, right? There's a, a saturation point for any ionic compound, for any compound really, when you try to dissolve it in water or any solvent, there comes a point where it won't dissolve anymore, right? So let's picture making a saturated salt water solution. You get it perfectly to the saturation point, and then you take a big crystal of salt and you add it there. Is it just, is it gonna dissolve? If you start at the saturation point, no. Is it going to stay as a crystal? Yes. Well, actually, 
So here's our saturated saltwater solution. We put a big salt, big block of salt in it, one big salt crystal. You give it time. It's going to become like more bigger, right? Or it's going to like build up in the. It turns out what happens is things are saturated because you've reached equilibrium where things are coming out of solution at the same speed that they're dissolving into the solution. So we think about it as a equilibrium process. Equilibrium happens when the forward reaction and the backward reaction happen at the same rate, right? It's not a static equilibrium. It doesn't mean that all motion stops once you hit equilibrium, right? It means there's no net change. But constantly you have things going back and forth. So if you take that big block of salt, it doesn't stay as one big salt crystal because that salt crystal dissolves into the, into the solution. But at the same time, some of these that are floating around react to form little salt crystals. At the bottom, you have a precipitation reaction happening at the same rate as the as the dissolution reaction. Um, it's actually one of the one of the oldest examples of a the, of um, or oldest pieces of evidence that equilibrium is a dynamic process. Is the fact that you can start with one crystal and it turns into a bunch of small crystals all the way across the bottom, because it's not just that things stop once you get there. Things constantly are happening forward and backward, just at the same rate. So what is the equilibrium expression here? What is, what is what's the first rule of equilibrium? Products over reactants, right? So, and then what's the third rule of equilibrium? No solids or liquids. So what is K here? And that's it. Because the solid doesn't show up, right? So this this just like um, Ka and Kb, we have a specific name for this type of equilibrium constant. Call this the solubility product. Because it's always going to be written a solid turns into its components. And so it's always going to be over one because the solids over here on the reactant side. So it's always going to be written as a product. Does anything change if it's not salt? Let's say if it was calcium chloride. What's going to change? Yeah, what's the formula for calcium chloride? Two. So our stoichiometry changes a little bit, our balancing changes a little bit. But it's the same basic process, right? KSP here, it's gonna be calcium concentration times chloride concentration squared. So we have a general form for this that actually is more intimidating than it needs to look, but that's what happens when you take numbers to replace some variables, right? You get something that looks a little bit scarier than it needs to be. This general form of a of the solubility product is your metal ion to the coefficient in front of your metal ion times your anion to the chart or to the uh, coefficient here. The reason that this is valuable, the reason why we bother to define this is because just like with Ka and Kb, if you know what Ka means, you don't have to write the, the dissolution or the um, uh, ionization reaction with water out every time, right? You don't have to write, if I say Ka for carbonic acid, you don't have to write it out. H2CO3 plus H2O goes to H3O plus HCO3 minus, right? 
because you just you know Ka means it gives one proton to water. You know Ksp means we just took it and we turned it into it into its pieces in water. So it just allows us to have tables of Ksp values without needing to write out the reaction every time. All right, so the problem with KSP though is that that's not usually how it's reported. When you look up solubility of a compound, you don't just get a KSP value. That would actually be better, but most people don't understand equilibrium. And so what you get instead is usually here's how many grams you can dissolve per liter. Right? You get your solubility is usually reported in concentration units, not as a KSP value. So that number, if it's in molarity, we call it molar solubility. More commonly, if you're out in the everyday world, you'll see it in terms of grams per liter or something like that. You can dissolve 100 grams of sugar per 100 milliliters of water, um, which sounds like a lot. It turns out that that's about right. Um, it's about a one-to-one -one weight ratio for water and sugar. That's where you get the saturation point for something like maple syrup. Um, which sounds kind of gross here. Actually, if you take a tablespoon of maple syrup, you're really just getting a tablespoon of sugar with, and so you might as well just be doing that, except it doesn't taste as good. Um, so I never run the numbers on maple syrup because you'll just be disgusted by how sugary it is. <laughs> um, yet you enjoy maple syrup, just leave it alone. Yeah, it's low glycemic index, isn't it? Relatively, compared to something like corn syrup, but it's still way higher than than something like a starch. Um, all right, so basically KSP and molar solubility are just two sides of the same coin, right? So just like with other concentration units, we can convert back and forth between them. So if we have something like silver chloride has a really low KSP value, which makes sense because when we think about our solubility rules, like we talked about, those of you who had lots Everybody in here had lab this morning. Um, we talked about how silver chloride is not soluble in water. Turns out it is just very, very barely because KSP is so small. <clears throat> so what does the reaction look like for, for silver chloride dissolving in water? And how many moles of silver chloride can you dissolve per liter? Take a few seconds. Get a head start and then I'll start working through this one. Start by writing out the reaction. Look at it in terms of, of an ice cream. What's the formula for silver chloride? AgCl2 or CL2Cl. AgCl. Silver is one of those exceptions in the in the transition metals, right? It's always plus one. This is the part where we were in a room that had a periodic table. I'd point to the periodic table and like remember these these six that are all together in the corner. Now, before we knew anything about equilibrium, we just said that this reaction didn't happen. We just said silver chloride is insoluble in water. Well, that's not strictly speaking true. It's a good approximation because of how little silver chloride dissolves. What is the expression for KSP? Yeah, if it's one to one, that's it's really easy, right? So assuming we started by dissolving this into DI water, what do we know about our initial concentrations of silver and chloride? 
to one to one, so they're the same. And what is their value at the very beginning before it starts to solve? Zero. Zero. I didn't leave myself room to write it out as an ice table, but our initial row for these two is just going to be zero, right? So it's going to be zero plus X and plus X. So in other words, <laughs> We're gonna get something like we're gonna get x squared is equal to the KSP value, right? Where x is gonna be these two concentrations, they're the same because it's a one-to-one -one ratio. Just like with hydronium concentration and your deprotonated weak acid, right? Just because we're we're starting from a solid, we don't need to worry about over initial concentration minus x. One minus three times ten to the negative five. So how many moles of silver chloride can dissolve in a liter of water at this temperature? One point three times ten to the minus five. <clears throat> These are all dependent on concent on um, temperature, right? We learned about how solubility of things is dependent on temperature back when we looked at solutions initially. In colligative properties, right? Change the temperature, you change KSP. It turns out you change the temperature, you change any of our K values, right? Think back to that K equals E to the minus delta G over RT. There's that T term in there. So K is always going to be dependent on temperature. So in the absence of more information like this, assume that the temperature is constant and you're at room temperature at 25 Celsius. So if you want the most dense sugary substance, you would want it to be pretty hot. It's exactly and same way another process for making maple syrup. Take maple sap mm -hmm. and you boil it. And you just basically drive off water until the point where you get to about a one-to-one -one ratio of water to um, sugar by mass. It'd be a great project, huh? I'm just kidding. It would be a, it's not a bad project. You can you know you can do it, you can make syrup actually with any any sugary sap. Um, pine sap doesn't work very well because it's already really thick. It has other stuff in it that doesn't taste good when it gets extra concentrated. But in the Northeast, they make, um, you can make uh, birch syrup out of birch trees. You could probably do the same thing with aspen, although I have no idea what aspen syrup would taste like. Alders. Alders, probably. They're pretty, th you know, most things that are deciduous that grow in that, that temperate, northern temperate regions um, will do that. Basically, you just might need something that lives, that grows naturally in, in an area where it gets below freezing at night and above freezing during the day in the springtime, and you could make syrup with it. It just might not taste very good, depending on what else is in there. I can't, I, pine, pine sap is already sticky enough. I can't imagine making a syrup. Okay. All right, let's do one more of these and then we'll take our break. What about magnesium hydroxide? Process doesn't change, but our formula does. Right? So assuming we're starting with no hydroxide and no magnesium, 
within sig figs, we know if we're in water, there's always some small amount of hydroxide floating around, right? But within sig figs, we're going to say it's zero. What is our change for each of them? <laughs> plus x and plus 2x. So at equilibrium, we're going to have an x and a 2x. <laughs> So 2.06, 10 to the minus 13 is equal to our magnesium concentration times our hydroxide concentration squared. Uh, 2.06 times 10 to the minus 13 equals x times 2x quantity squared. This is the one that always gets people because it seems like we're counting that 2 twice because we are. But it, that's the right mathematical step. There's going to be a 2x and then you're going to square the 2 as well. <laughs> I have a question on that. Yeah. I feel like last quarter that was kind of tripping some of us up on when it needed to be squared. Um, Anytime you've got a coefficient, it'll also be squared. It'll also be squared. So not only do you get the plus 2x, it's also squared. If in this was a 3, it'd be plus 3x and it'd be cubed. Okay. So, okay. And it seems that seems counterintuitive. Like I said, yeah. right? It seems like you're double counting that too. But that's what happens to the probability of these things running into each other. Not only do you get twice as many of them, when you get twice as many of them, the odds that they run into each other are squared. So it does get taken into account twice, but that's the way probability behaves. That is actually the right way to do it. When there's a coefficient. When there's a coefficient. Is that for any kind of equilibrium problem? Yep. When we get into rates, we'll see what, where that comes from. But basically, a lot of this has to do with what's the probability that two things run into each other. And if you put twice as many hydroxides in there, the probability that two hydroxides run into each other goes up as a factor of two, or squared. So you not only do you dump extra pieces in there, and which then increases the probability that they run into each other by square. So mathematically, this looks a little bit different than the one we just did, but at the same time, not really, right? We're just going to get 4x cubed equals 2.0, 6 times 10 to the minus 13. <laughs> x times 4x squared is 4x cubed. And if you don't know where the um, cube root button is on your calculator, how do you yeah. undo this? 3 to the power of 1 third. I don't know, but so you just divide both sides by 4. <laughs> and then you're going to do this number to the one third power. It's the same thing as taking the cube root of it. I'm getting 3.7 times 10 to the negative 5. I did not quite that my calculator. That's about right. You got his learning mill. He's got to go back. So Mathematically and algebraically, it can get a little bit trickier to solve for x if it's a higher power and you have these other coefficients in there. But really, it's the same process every time for KSP. With one 
caveat. What happens if you're not starting with the eye water? Ooh. Yep. That's going to mess with things because now you don't get to put zero in for your initial over here, right? That's You're still going to set up your ice table the same way, but it's not going to be zero plus X. It's going to be some number. If you have a starting concentration of chloride, there's going to be some number there already. So it'll be something plus X. Which again, you might have to get out a solver to solve that. We'll do some practice with that after we take a break. Let's come back to five after. <laughs> Unless I tell you otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you say something about the molar constant? Molar solubility is equal to something in the real life. I thought you said molarity, and I was kind of confused. So, so molar, molar solubility would be in molarity units. Oh, that's what you said. Okay. Because it's how many moles can you dissolve per liter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but when it's, it's just a specific type of molarity. The units are just molarity, but it's just saying this is how many moles you can dissolve before it's saturated. So I'm just want to say it's still going, but there's like if, because of my bio fab class, the way it's set up right now, if I take Monday, Wednesday lab, I'm in class five days a week. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to get to do seven days of trash. Yeah. <laughs> Only five days of trash. Yeah. And like, That's what it was for me in the last two quarters. And I was so thankful that it was just like grossly snowing and raining for a lot of the weekends because it was like, I'm exhausted. Yeah. So I go from class to work and it'll be like 15 hour days, three days a week. And then I'm going to have Saturday. Or just so like you won't feel bad about us. Yeah. But like, thank God. <laughs> yeah. I don't have any energy to like literally talk to anyone. <laughs> Were they talking to you or to each other? Yeah, I mean, just like Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean,
So, Evan, are you in the queue right now? Yeah. Here's, the, here's where you do it. You have A goes to B. The rate of the reaction, change in A, with respect to the change in time. Let's do it with It turns out that's the rate law is going to be to usually something where that this to some x log where x could be zero, one, or two in most of the cases. But that right there, that's a differential equation, right? That's the every second of the distribution of h to the section very And you can integrate this with respect to the times. So we'll, we'll use the integrated form with the because they can use that to figure out. You take a little math and more demonstrates there. If you give it count three, you wind up being three regs because you might even have to do some of these derivations for one assumption of the base. You can play every time to yourself, but I don't know. And then it's like, all right, let's watch me the Like there's nothing that I can pay more for the second like some of the actors that go And like honestly, yeah, it's like a topic on like yeah, make it your own. But yeah, I didn't like any I only want I want to
If we have one liter of water, and we've got a KSP value, we're going to get a plus X, plus 2X here. Even at equilibrium, we're going to have concentration of lead, which is going to be X. Concentration of chloride is going to be 2X. So 1.17, 10 to the minus 5, equals x times 2x squared, because that was our original expression, right? We plug them in. Do the same thing, we're going to wind up five by four, raise it to the one third power, or take the cube root, whatever buttons you have on your calculator. You get for X. Something times 10 to the minus 2. 1.4. Mm -hmm. Grams of lead 2 chloride is that going to be? 0.43. Oh, yeah. That's moles. So, in terms of grams per liter, one mole of lead to chloride is going to be what's lead six two oh seven and plus another seventy, so like what two seventy, right around two eighty, something like that. Seventy, really close to two seventy seven, isn't it? Molecular weight of lead 2 chloride? 278.1. 278.1. And we did want to put it not in molar solubility, but in terms of grams of solubility. It's a quick calculation with, uh, with the molecular weight. If we do this right, if we set this our ice table up right, X is always going to be our molar um, solubility, right? Because Regardless of what our coefficients are over here, it's always for one mole of the solid, right? So in terms of the solid, as long as we, we use our coefficients right in our ice table, X will always be the molar solubility. We want it in the mass solubility. We do a quick molecular weight calculation. So we'll get something like something like three grams. Per liter. Remember, we started in moles per liter and then we took cancel out moles and we're left in grams per liter. Which that kind of sounds like that's not a small amount really of, of lead to be able to dissolve. We think of lead chloride as being insoluble in water, but four grams per liter, I mean, four grams is probably a teaspoon. It's not a lot, but that's more lead than you want in your drinking water, right? What's the safe amount of lead in your drinking water? Zero. <laughs> what's what's the amount of lead in everybody's drinking water? Non-zero. Is that really dense though? So what would be like? It, it depends on the density. This lead is a, as a metal is really dense. I don't know about lead when it says an ionic compound. I'd have to look that up. What about so this is one of the reasons this is a really interesting um, topic. Is because of what I hinted at right before, 
class. What if you started with a solution that was 0.1 molar NaCl instead of being the eye water? If you started with some amount of chloride in there, one point, or let's start by writing out the ice table. It's still the same reaction here. We're going to ignore. The, the fact that there's sodium ions around because sodium doesn't factor into this equilibrium process. Because this equilibrium process is based only on lead concentration and chloride concentration. We're still starting with zero lead. But now we're starting with 0 0.100 molar chloride, right? Does our C row change? Does our change row any different than it was before? It's still going to be plus X and plus 2X here, right? So when we actually solve for X, the equations are gonna look different. But as far as writing this out, that's gonna drastically change what X is once we solve for it, right? 1.17, 10 to the minus five equals X times 0 0.100 plus 2x squared. Didn't bother to rewrite that out. I was just saying that that is our KS piece um, equation now, right? Can we try to use the small x approximation with this one? You can, because we know X is not going to be that big because you're already starting with so much chloride. So the amount of chloride that we're going to add to the system by dissolving lead to chloride is probably going to be pretty small. We can't assume that X is zero, though, or we just get zero equals KSP. But we can assume that this X is close to zero. Um, or... We can plug it into Wolfram Alpha or whatever solver you want to use, Desmos. Um, if you're old school and have a TI 83 plus that has a solver built into it, it's a real pain in the butt to type these things in for those, but um, they work as well. This is my go to because um, the input works pretty well. So it's with 1.17. E minus O5 equals X times 0 0.1 plus 2X squared, solve for X. Make sure that your input looks right. That's what we were looking for, right? That's the way we had it written on the on the slide. ASP value times X times 0 0.1 plus 2X squared. So we get X is 0 0.001. So a factor of 10 times smaller than it was, right? Because it was 1 times 10 to the minus 2. Now it's 1 times 10 to the minus 3. And then how do we know which of these X values is the right X value? The one, yeah, only one of them is, is a positive number, right? And only one of them doesn't involve I. <laughs> um, now I does show up in chemistry, but mostly just in quantum mechanics. Um, so if you're interested in knowing more about how I shows up in quantum mechanics, um, ask me later. But 
we can assume that our concentration does not have a high in it. That seems like a reasonable thing to assume, right? There's no imaginary concentrations. No. Never know. Yeah, not with that attitude. There. All right, so. Broke my side. <laughs> I like that. So this is what's called the common ion effect. If you have two different ionic compounds that have that share the same ion in one of them, so sodium chloride and lead two chloride, they're going to interact with each other. And usually one of them will be at saturation point, the other one won't. Basically, you be, this is not a saturated solution of sodium chloride. So we can basically treat the sodium chloride like a not really an equilibrium process. We look at whatever KSP value is the smallest, and that's the one that's actually going to be affected by this, this common ion effect. Um, and, now, and this is actually, this is how they treat um, well water on groundwater in general for hazardous metals. Most hazardous metals have a really low KFP value with, with at least one common ion. Most hazardous metals are more stable as solids or more likely to be found as solids that aren't very soluble in water. So all you really have to do is is uh, add a little bit of sodium chloride to the water or whatever carbonate gets used all the time too because it doesn't affect the taste that much. Um, if you add carbonate to something that has lead in it, you make lead to carbonate, which has a really low KSP value. And the sodium just stays dissolved in it in small concentrations. Um, So, and that's that's actually what happens with precipitation reactions. You guys used Q for equilibrium, right? When you were going to figure out which way the reaction was going to go. Um, if we look at what happens when you take a, a solution that had, in this case, this was uh, silver nitrate, we added um, sodium chromate to it. We wind up making solid silver chromate because we actually got, we got a Q above KSP. We had too much at our initial column or initial row in our ice table. Q was greater than KSP. So you needed to take some of those ions and turn them into being a solid until you got Q equal to KSP. So that's all a precipitation reaction really is, is it's a momentary situation where you have too much um, of your ions dissolved, where Q is greater than KSP. And what happens when Q is not equal to K? Q tries to get to K, right? The only way that you can do that is by taking some of those ions, turning them into a solid, um, which is also, you didn't know this when you were asking me about those, uh, those slides earlier today. Um, this is exactly what they do to test what ions are present in water as well, not only just to remove them, but also to test what ions are present. Um, you can start by, if we have a mixture of three different metal ions, metal cations, take some, if you know, okay, it's probably one of the, you know, these are my most likely ions. Add something that precipitates one of them out, but not the other two. And then you're left with a solid forming at the bottom. And then your other cations, what is it? B and C are still dissolved. You can take that, uh, if you use that term in lab before, decant, you decant something. Um, it doesn't mean that you're pouring wine. It does mean you're pouring wine sometimes, but decant literally means in chemistry terms, you're pouring the liquid and leaving the solid behind. The reason it gets used in with wine is because in, in um, I won't say archaic, but previous generations, all that sediment that sits at the bottom, there's a lot less sediment in modern wine than there used to be. There, most wine used to have a bunch of sediment sitting at the bottom of the bottle, a bunch of stuff you don't want to drink that tastes bad, leftovers from fermentation or other sol solids that form. So what you would do when you opened a bottle of wine is you would just immediately pour it into a, into a decanter to leave behind all the sediment, and then you would pour it from the decanter into the wine glasses. But it's literally just doing this process. You just take this, pour it, leave the solid at the bottom of the glass, 
And now we have just two of our three cations. Do the same thing again, decant. And then we're left with just one ion still dissolved in here. So this, this process of sequentially removing things is one is, it's kind of old school now, uh, way of treating water because now we have things like remote osmosis filters, reverse osmosis filters. Um, they can remove everything at once and more completely than this process does. But a lot of what we understand now about water treatment comes from um, our understanding of solubility and KSP. Do you have questions? No discussion. Sure. But also, I do. Okay, so <laughs> like when we precipitate, like in lab class, like the lab, like nothing became like an actual solid. Do things actually become solids, like with when you're doing that? So kind of stuff? a powder is still a solid. So they do become solids. They're just solids in really small pieces. So you you let it settle to the bottom and you pour it very slowly, just carefully. Or what you do is you take a pasture pipette and you and you use a, um, a pasture pipette to pull the liquid off as much as you can. They also you there's also a technique where you use a called a filter tip pipe filter tip pasture pipette. You literally just take a little bit of cotton and you stuff it into the bottom of the pasture pipette, and it acts as a filter, a physical filter that just keeps any of the, the stuff from coming through. Um, it's really, really slow because the cotton tends to get packed in there really well, and you wind up breaking a bunch of them. First time you learn how to do this. Um, but it's a pretty, again, kind of old school at this point, but there are lots of ways of removing fine powders from things that are pretty, pretty straightforward. <laughs> Um, but to your other question, Sydney, about can you actually make something that looks more like what we think of as one solid object? Can you, that's crystallization. And so all you have to do if you want to make one big crystal instead of a bunch of tiny crystals is you do it really, really slowly. If you start, if you basically let it crystallize out really, really slowly by doing something like have a saturated solution, and instead of adding something to make it precipitate out, if you just let the solvent evaporate on its own. So almost like that crystal candy thing, like you yeah. do with kids. Okay. Yeah, rock candy is basically you start from simple syrup with a piece of wood stuck into the liquid. And then as the liquid evaporates on its own, as the water evaporates on its own, you get sugar crystals start to form on the, on the wood. Um, so in general, the slower you let a process happen, the bigger crystals you can make form. Um, and there's actually entire communities online, people that make crystals at home from stuff like copper sulfate, stuff that dissolves really well in water. If you let it crystallize out slowly, you can get these really pretty blue crystals um, to form. You just have to keep them away from water because otherwise they'll just redissolve back into water. Um, but it's kind of a fun process. It's it's like having a sourdough starter or something you have to take care of every day, but you do like spend 10 minutes on it and then you can ignore it for the rest of the day. It's like a, a really really boring pet. Put it in the fridge, okay? Exactly. <laughs> well, I, I'm not suggesting you do that to your dog. <laughs> um, here's a more, a more thorough and a more detailed explanation of a qualitative analysis process. Um, basically, it's just turning your solubility rules into a flow chart. Because if you have all these different categories of, of metal ions, they're, they're grouped based on what will precipitate with what, just like your solubility rules, right? So these, these ones written in uh, purple are the ones where, are the only metal ions really where fluoride will make them precipitate out. Everything else, fluoride is soluble. So you can remove silver chloride, mercury one chloride, lead two chloride by just adding HCl. And then, but everything else is still left in there, right? So then you just go to the next category. Okay, out of these, sulfides are mostly soluble with the exception of the ones in red. So if you add a little sulfide to it, you get all of these to form as a solid. And you're left with one fewer category here, right? And you just go down the list. And when anytime you get it, and there's, 
they're sort of zoomed in versions. Well, so you, if you form a solid here, it's going to be one of these. How do you know which one? Well, there's different ways of telling. You can look at the color sometimes, um, or you can fine tune it a little bit and actually try and figure out what the stoichiometry is to figure out, is it this Bi2S3 or is it CUS? Just based on how many moles of sulfide it takes to get it to precipitate out, you can work backwards from the stoichiometry to figure out the formula. Um, so, and then, but then you can also just keep going. So, okay, well then I didn't have anything precipitate out for group three. So I don't, I know I don't have any of these, but then I do have a precipitate from group four with the phosphates, right? So it's just basically just a flowchart way of doing process of elimination. What's present, what's not. Cross off everything that's not present. If you think it might be one of a few things, you just leave them all as possibilities and try to come up with another way of eliminating some of them. Um, the more practical way, if you're doing something like uh, brewing beer at home and you want to use tap water, you need to know what ions are present in your water and what the pH is and what the alkalinity is and things like that. Um, if it's coming out of your tap though, and you're not on well water, it means you can just look up what the water quality report is from, from Stupid because they have a PDF available that they update every six months on what are the latest test results, how much chloride is in there, how many chlorine, how much chlorine is in there how much magnesium, how much calcium, all that's all publicly available. They're required by the government to publish that for everybody to look at every six months or something like that. Could you be shoot chlorine to our in our water though? So depending on where you live, could you have a more higher concentration of chlorine? You can. And so for a long time, I, I, home, I home brewed up here without any issues using the tap water. And then they upped the amount of chlorine or something changed about our water source. The point where I um, you can't really homebrew with the tap water without treating it for chlorine up here now, um, but all of that's going to be dependent on things like like how much water we've gotten recently, where is the water being stored, where is your house relative to the water treatment plant, because a lot of the chlorine winds up disappearing. Yeah. By the time, and that's why most of us don't taste chlorine when we drink our tap water. Right, our tap water up here tastes really good. They don't chlorinate it much. But if you brew with it and yeast interacts with the small levels of chlorine that are in your tap water, they make something called chloroquinols. And chloroquinols, our tongue is much better attuned to than just chlorine. Chloroquinols, we can detect in the parts per billion range. Chlorine, we're in the parts per million range. So even though the water tastes good, if you brew with it, you can wind up causing issues um, that, where it doesn't taste good. But that's, while it's an interesting digression for me, maybe not for everybody. Um, and it's been years since I actually tested any of that. The whole point is, if you're going to do any home brewing, use distilled water. Go to the grocery store and just get jugs of distilled water, or you have to treat it with aquarium, um, aquarium chloramine remover. Anyway, let's talk about one more aspect of equilibrium, which are called complex ions. So complex ions are kind of exactly what they sound like. It turns out when you when you take any metal, metal ions are known for doing this, but other ions will do this as well, anions will do this as well. Um, if it's a good Lewis acid, it'll actually wind up being an electron acceptor, right? That's what a Lewis acid means. If it's a good electron acceptor, it can wind up basically surrounding itself with water molecules, with the lone pairs from oxygen and water molecules. And when it does that, it behaves like it's a slightly different compound. It's really still just silver, silver ion and water. Really, I should do like a dotted line because it's not a true covalent bond. But this whole thing together, which usually we'll put it in brackets to represent that it's it's one object, basically, this behaves like it's its own chemical in terms of equilibrium. This has its own concentration that's different than the concentration of silver. Concentration of silver is, con is silver ions dissolved in water 
without forming these bonds with the water molecules. And these complex ions wind up having their own equilibrium expressions. So basically, as, as with everything in chemistry, as soon as we learn, you learn the general case and learn like the, the, you know, the normal way of thinking about it, we say, but really, there's one layer deeper. We need to think about it. This is a case of that. Instead of just thinking about silver as being by itself when it's aqueous, it's really present as this complex ion. Um, and the, the molecules that surround the metal um, are called ligands. And basically, the different strength that you can make these bonds is going to affect their own equilibrium process. And so, um, and the K values for these, these, these ones are not as universal enough because a lot of times there's more than one possible um, complex ion you can form. But we, we have K values tabulated for these. So we'd say that the KF for silver dihydrate or a silver, that, uh, there is a whole different nomenclature, so I'm not going to mis misname it right now, for this complex is going to have its own KF value, right? And if you change what the ligand is, you're going to change what the KF is, because if we add something like ammonia instead of just water, that's going to have a different KF value than water surrounding these metal ions. And this winds up mattering because it really drastically affects the solubility. Because we, we just looked at this reaction, right? We figured out what the molar solubility was for, um, for silver chloride. It was something like 1.3 times 10 to the minus 5. But if we have two reactions happening. If there's a little bit of ammonia present in the water as well. You wind up forming this, and look at how big this KF value is. 10 to the 7 means that if we actually look at this entire process, we want to know the total amount of silver we can get to dissolve. Adding a little bit of ammonia is going to really, really dramatically increase how much silver we can get to dissolve in water. Or how much silver chloride we can get to dissolve in water. What do we get if we combine these two reactions? What's the overall reaction when we combine them? Well, anything that's on the reactant side gets added together, right? And then anything on the product side and anything that's on both sides gets canceled out, right? So pretend I could write the rest of that formula. Silver is going to cancel out, right? Because the fact that we're making a complex ion means we're not actually stopping at silver. What is K value going to be for this combined reaction? Well, when we add them, we multiply the K values together, right? So we're going to get something like 2.5-ish times 10 to the minus 3. I did my mental arithmetic right. 1.7 times 1.8 is about 2.5. Okay, sorry, why did you cancel out the silver there? Because when we add the two reactions together, anything that's both a reactant and a product cancels out. 3.0? 3.0. Oh, yeah. What about the square root of 3 is 1.77, huh? I just multiplied those two numbers, uh, right? Okay. Should have been the same thing. 3.0 times 10 to the minus 3, right? That's a much different K value. K 
than for our silver in pure water. Silver in pure water has KSP at 10 to the minus 10. Now all of a sudden we're at 10 to the minus three. We increased the solubility by a, a pretty significant factor here, right? Of course, it's hard to just look at the K values because we also have more complicated reaction now, right? Now our combined reaction is silver chloride solid plus two ammonia aqueous turns into chloride and So we don't just get a pure solubility product answer now. Because <clears throat> we get K equals now we do have products over reactants, right? Chloride, our complex, ion. All of that over concentration of NH3 squared because now we have this piece as a reactant but all of it it's still just all following our standard rules for equilibrium right this is just a new application of it but it's still just equilibrium products over reactants so if we have some amount of ammonia present in our water, that's going to really dramatically impact that, that molarity of our silver. So let's take that. What is the molar solubility of silver chloride in a solution that starts as 0.50 moles per liter ammonia? We had a value for, for um, molar solubility of silver chloride in pure water. That was our, that 1.3 times 10 to the minus 5, right? Pretty small concentration. What do we get if we start with it being 0.5 molar ammonia? 0.5 molar ammonia. Start with, right, go back to that combined reaction that I wrote out. And write an ice table out, solve for X. Because when we combine, so just the same way if we added two reactions together and we had the enthalpies, we could just add the enthalpies together, right? Yeah. To get the combined one. But because K has that E to the minus energy over our T, yeah. because it's in the exponent, we yeah. can't just add KSP and KF, we have to multiply them together. Okay. So anytime we're going to combine two different equilibrium reactions together, if you're adding the reactions, you multiply the K values. Thank you. No problem. For our initial row, we don't have anything on the product side. What's our change going to look like? Minus 2x, 
And over here, convenient stoichiometry, right? It's just plus X and plus X. And we're going to wind up squaring it, right? So we're going to wind up with what it was. It was 3.0 and the minus three was our K, our combined K value. We're going to get X and X on top and on the bottom, 0 0.50 minus 2X, one of these squared. So again, one that's not all that friendly to solve. We might, and with K being so large, we probably can't assume that K is going to be a small number, or sorry, that X is going to be a small number. So you're probably going to have to use a solver here. No, but I want to ask you a question like this on the test. Um, on the test, you'll either be able to make the assumption that X is small, or I'll stop the question at what is the combined um, A value or something like that. Right, doesn't it? Once again, we're gonna get two answers, but pick the one that makes sense. It can't be a negative in this case because we know that we have to make some amount of chloride dissolved, right? It has to be a real number. Can't have a negative concentration of anything. So 0 0.0246, 2468, how cool. So, then, and what was the number for, uh, for just as it was just the square root of this, right? So it was molar molar solubility in pure water was 1.3 times 10 to the minus five. So we made it a thousand times more soluble. We were able to dissolve a thousand times more silver chloride by doing it in a solution of ammonia. So this is one of the reasons why you have things like um if you if you uh has anybody ever gone down a a TikTok or YouTube shorts rabbit hole about cleaning products, cleaning videos. There's some really satisfying ones, right? They almost always use vinegar. A lot of times they use vinegar because a lot of times you wind up with making something more acidic increases the solubility pretty dramatically because of this. Yeah. I thought I had one more slide where it looked at the um at uh, there's another another example we could do is what what do we happens if we throw in a ka value instead of a ksp or we have ksp and ka instead of a kf value nothing's really different you can still combine the reactions the same way and then we get a different k for the combined reaction but we can look at stuff like how well does calcium carbonate dissolve calcium carbonate is the major component in most lime scale right if you take it and you apply, if you give it uh, acid, you add the fact that you can protonate those carbonates. Calcium carbonate has a really low KSP value, but if you're taking the carbonates and turning them into hydrogen carbonates because you're in an acidic solution, you get a totally different reaction happening. Not totally different. You get a coupled equilibrium reaction happening that really, really dramatically increases solubility. 
since we have a minute or so. Ah, it's Thursday the first week. You can you can go four minutes early. I won't go one more time. It's wrong. Check over the weekends. Check how to take that quiz. Remember, the part of that quiz is going to be um, research project ideas. Right. Yeah. 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 You could probably go, but you could probably sound a little bit keep more on into thinking about it. Okay, well, you're forming these complexes by having something dissolved in water, that's going to disrupt the crystal structure. So it's related. In some ways, but not the very constant. Okay, makes sense. Yeah, I mean, well, that makes sense. Yeah. But you follow formation of complex ions. Baby. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Forget about I. I should. Uh, well, that's a bit of red herring. It really proves the point that we're not depression problem. I didn't mean to do that. Okay. 